Good afternoon. We're live online. Uh, we're live in person. It is a real pleasure uh, to be with you here this afternoon. My name is David Legg. I'm a faculty member at Mount Royal University in the Department of Health and Physical Education. And I'm also a co-chair and co-founder of what's called the Calgary Adapted Hub powered by Jumpstart. And this is an opportunity for us now to partner with the Canadian Sport Institute, Alberta, on an initiative where we're talking about the upcoming Paralympic Games, which are taking place in Paris in late August. And we have a fantastic panel here today to both promote the games, but also the connections between the Canadian Sport Institute, Alberta, the Stedridge Center at the University of Alberta, Calgary Adapted Hub powered by Jumpstart, and all of the other players and mechanisms and organizations such as Sport Calgary that are here today in how we are trying to rise and raise all ships through partnerships as it relates to adaptive physical activity. Um, the first speaker, so we're, we're gonna kind of divide this into two sections. So, so Frank's gonna convene a panel discussion with two of our athletes and I'm going to initiate the conversation with the colleague to my immediate right, who is Dr. Robert Stedward, uh, Professor Emeritus at the University of Alberta and the founding president of the International Paralympic Committee. So the IPC was created in 1989 um, and Dr. Sedward was the founding president and one of the, the people that helped create the IPC and has been involved in disability sport uh, since the 1960s as a professor at the University of Alberta primarily. And what we're going to spend some time talking about Dr. Sedward and I is the history and the, the start of the paramilitary movement, but specifically in Alberta. And so how uh, University of Alberta hosting the first wheelchair national games, the creation of the Stedward Center, uh, the connection between Calgary and Alberta as it relates and other areas outside of those two major urban centers as it relates to adaptive physical activity, leading up to, of course, then celebrating the Paris Games taking place of which you'll be attending um, this August. So Dr. Sedward, if I can, I'd like you to take us back to the 1960s when you were a president, or not a president, but you were a professor um, at the University of Alberta. And I'd love you just to walk us through what it was like with the initiation of some of the early adaptive physical activity programs there, and then with the University of Alberta hosting the first national games um, on the track there, leading up to then the creation of the Canadian Wheelchair Sports Association soon thereafter. And just your reflections on what it was like back then insofar as kind of the earliest days of adaptive physical activity in an Alberta context. Uh, thank you, David, and, and good morning, everyone, or good afternoon now. It's nice to see so many nice, familiar faces. And uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of this event today. Uh, well, my goodness, uh, back, in, back in 1967 or 66, uh, Winnipeg was planning to host the first uh, Para Pan American Games. But the Pan American Committee at the time didn't see them much as a fit. So they worked at it and worked at it, and they were finally accepted. And at that, uh, and at those games in 67, that's when we first started talking about creating a national organization for Canada to, to be involved more with athletes living with a disability. Uh, now, at the time, uh, the only disabled individuals that were involved internationally uh, were spinal cord injured. However, in Canada, we did have uh, amputees, cerebral palsy involved with wheelchair sports per se. So at that time, we felt we should put together a national set of games. And we had a dean at the time, uh, Maury Van Vliet, who said, well, that's very easy. We're going to host it in Edmonton at the University of Alberta. And so as a student at the time, he called me into his office, said, this is what I've, this is a commitment that I've made, and you will be doing these games. So it was a very democratic process. And that's where I learned from the best. So we hosted the first games there, and not only uh, were they were they sick, they were very successful in '68. But we also had to select a team to go to the Stoke Mandeville Games in England and to Jamaica for the uh, for the Pan American Games uh, down in Jamaica. So that all took place 
uh, between about midnight and four in the morning over a period of about four days because everyone had commitments to their provincial teams uh, in the competitions at that time. Uh, and we were also very blessed at the time at U of A to have uh, two or three people involved in adapted physical activity, um, both in uh, the Special Olympic side of, of the coin as well as uh, physical disability side of the coin. So it was really nice to be able to offer programs to our students and courses in adapted physical activity uh, dealing with, with all disabilities. And so that's where it sort of bubbled up uh, at, uh, in Edmonton at the university uh, back in, uh, in 68. And as I said, the rest is, is history, I guess, because it, it grew from there. We, we did have a, a national organization called the Canadian Wheelchair Sports Association. And then from there, I was dealing with the um, provincial government to take our provincial teams to national, but we didn't have a provincial association. We only had a club in Edmonton and the province would not deal with an association that wasn't provincially based. So I was sitting at the pool with a couple of my athletes at the time. So after they finished their workout, we took a piece of paper and said, okay, you'll be the president, you'll be the secretary, treasurer, et cetera. And we created the provincial association on the deck of the East Pool of the university in Edmonton in 1970. And therefore we were able to get the funds necessary for ongoing support for national championships and the start of, of provincial games as well. So throughout the 1970s, disability sport involved in the first Paralympic games were held in 1960 in the Rome. Uh, they were a follow-up to what were called the Stoke Manville games, which were hosted at a hospital uh, northwest of London, where uh, a, uh, a, a physiatrist had created opportunities for spinal cord injury veterans uh, to participate in sport. So Paralympic Games started in 1960 in Rome. The Winter Games have their first games in 1976. And you were involved in, in many of these earlier games. Toronto hosted the summer. Uh, it was called the Toronto Olympiad for the Physically Disabled, obviously in Toronto at that time. And the, the Olympics were in Montreal that year. In the 80s, uh, 84, the, the, the Paralympic Games were, were dealing with some challenges, I would say, from a, a popularity, well, not popularity, but a notoriety and who was going to host them. And so they were not hosted in Russia when Moscow hosted the Olympic Games in 1980. They were not held in Los Angeles when they hosted the Olympic Games in 1984. And the, the games were actually split at that time. The wheelchair events were hosted in Stoke Manville and the other disability groups were hosted in Long Island. And so at that point, there was a bit of a turning point. And you were involved then in coming to Calgary, which was hosting the Winter Olympic Games. And so the, the Winter Paralympic model had not yet been created where the same city hosted both the Olympic and Paralympic Games. So Calgary did not host the Paralympic Games in 1988. But I want you to talk about coming down to Calgary and meeting with Juan Antonio Samaranch and your negotiations with him insofar as the resulting birth of the modern Paralympic movement, which was when Seoul, Korea hosted both the Olympic and Paralympic Games, and then kind of the, the earliest creation then of the International Paralympic Committee in 1989. So I take us, so, so we're gonna jump ahead from the 60s when you were involved in the University of Alberta and the creation of some of these provincial and local initiatives to kind of, again, Alberta being at the forefront of the creation of an international movement, the International Paralympic Committee. Um, well, <clears throat> during the 70s, uh, the Paralympics were Stoke Mandeville Games, Spinal Paralyzed, uh, because that's what uh, Sir Ludwig Goodman had created. <clears throat> but as you know, in Canada, US, and a few other countries, we had other disabilities participating in the sport. So uh, Canada hosted the first multi-disabled games in 76, Toronto Olympiad. And following that, uh, when we went uh, in 1980 into Arnhem in the, in the uh, in the Netherlands, um, we didn't have a world body. So the president, the secretary general, and the uh, sport director of the different international federations uh, of disability sports, so visually impaired, cerebral palsy, et cetera, 
came together. So there were 12 individuals and they ran the Paralympics over a period of four to six years. And, and we in Canada were not very happy with that because we felt there needed to be um, a world organization that was built on democracy with national representation, et cetera. So I stuck, uh, uh, took my neck and stuck it out a bit further. I wrote um, a, a document and circulated around the world, said, here is a new world structure that I think might work. That was in 1984. And then following that in Arnhem in the Netherlands in 1987, we met, uh, we being the, as many nations as possible, there were 40 nations who met. And basically we started the foundation of the new uh, organization which would eventually become the International Paralympic Committee. And there were seven basic principles that the organization eventually got founded on. During that same period, I knew Calgary was hosting the uh, Olympics in 88 for the winter, and Samaranch was going to be here. So I came down and paid him a visit and told him that I have a new organization that's going to start, and we'd like to start it with Seoul in uh, South Korea because there's one committee organizing both games using the same facilities, et cetera. The only difference was, was the village because we needed more of an accessible village, which they built for us. So I met with him here and he said, well, tell me about it. Well, I said, I don't have the material with me, but I can send it to you. No, no, you can't send it to me. You come to Seoul in the summer and you tell me what you have in mind. So I did. And surprisingly, he thought it was a good idea because he would only have to deal with one world body then. He would not have to deal with six different organizations that was based on disability, not based on sport. And so that led to the creation of the um, founding uh, General Assembly in September 22nd in Dusseldorf, Germany, where we created the International Paralympic Committee. But I wasn't finished with just that because now that I had the hook on Samaranch, one of our basic premises was to make sure that we still believed in inclusion and integration and accessibility. So I had to do some educating of IOC members, but as well to convince the IOC members and Sam Ranch himself that going forward, we need to continue with one city, one organizing committee uh, to host both the Olympics and the Paralympics. And <clears throat> that was difficult because we knew that both games couldn't happen together. They're just too large. And so we would go after the Olympic Games because we wanted to get the test events over with before the Paralympics came. And so it took me then from 1988, which was just like the Olympics in 1896, was the modern Olympic Games, and 88 was the modern Paralympic Games. And it took me 12 years from then to convince the International Olympic Committee and the IOC members to sign a memorandum of understanding to ensure that what Sam Ranch and I agreed to 12 years earlier would continue forward, uh, which as you, you know today with the Paralympics uh, now and the organization uh, being the second largest sporting movement in the world. Uh, when I was the founding president in 89, I had four staff members because that the IOC gave us the money. Today, there's 150 staff members and a magnificent facility in, in Bonn, Germany, and with over 200 countries now. So we have had really some nice, pleasant growth over those uh, 30 years. Frank, am I can I ask one more question? Don't forget, though, you had some unbelievably good graduate students and undergraduate students like Claire... Claire Wilson, Claire Fuster, at the University of Alberta to help you then too. 
anyway, okay. So I'll ask, I'll ask one last question. So we've gotten from uh, 2001 when you, when you signed the agreement with Sam Ranch and the first games to actually fall under those guidelines would have been the Beijing games in 2008. And so for the last leading up to Los Angeles, so for 20 years now, it's been agreed that if a city's going to bid for an Olympic games, they're also bidding for a Paralympic games and vice versa. If you're bidding for a Paralympic, you're also bidding for an Olympic games. So you'll be going to the Paris games in late August. How many Paralympic games will that be for you total? All of them except two. So all of them, like going back to 1960. Yes. <laughs> except I two. Didn't make the... You didn't make those games. Yeah. Okay. So all of them, with the exception of two Paralympic games you've attended uh, since, since they were created, you're going to the Paris games. You'll be there for the opening ceremonies. I'm just curious to know, what will your thoughts be watching the opening ceremonies in Paris and thinking about the differences and the changes you've seen in the last 60 years? Well, I think it's it's it has it's been exponential, but I gradually see it grow and develop. Uh, the family has become bigger. It's become more challenging to manage. But to see now that we've got professional coaches involved for our athletes, to see that we have a professional medical staff to work with our athletes uh, and administrators, so that. The whole um, organization has grown in uh, every different direction that it's, uh, it's uh, you know, I can't, e I have to give my head a shake because I think back to the 1960s and, and then to the 2000 games in Sydney when I signed the MOU with Sam Ranch and I saw the things that were happening and the other side of the coin, you know, we we weren't without our our problems with uh, drugs and sport and cheating, et, et cetera. We know that. Uh, but I think by and large, we've grown into a very, very successful world body. And it's because of the, the volunteers, but also the growth of the, the staff and the coaches and the people that, that have taken our athletes from once being referred to and, cons and uh, thought of as patients now to be thought of first and foremost uh, as athletes. And I really saw that interestingly um, in, uh, in Sydney, Australia, because prior to that, we would see mums and dads with children who would avoid um, approaching one of our athletes because they weren't sure what to say, what to do or anything. But in Sydney, you'd be down down at the waterfront and our athletes would be all over the place and kids would be running across the road to to get their autograph asking them what sport they played in they didn't even they didn't think of any kind of a disability here whatsoever because there wasn't it was all about their ability to perform as a as a high performance athlete and to see the performances change uh you know the first uh marathon that was done in three hours and three and a half hours now they're in an hour and 40 an hour and 50 minutes now it's the remarkable performances have improved and and you know the facilities the equipment the people the the education that our our coaches have received that the universities are providing and uh and i always brag because i say that you know this whole situation started in Canada because the first opportunities of sport and recreation and competition started at the uh, Deer Rehab Center in 1943, in 1944 in Winnipeg, even before Stoke Mandeville. Uh, it's just that Stoke Mandeville really took, took the bull by the horns, they said, and really grew it. But uh, we have to be proud to say so much of it uh, was as a result of leadership that came from many of the many of the people in Canada. We don't we don't have time to go through. I, I mean, you think about some of the contributions Canadians have made to disability sport, whether it's Rick Hansen, Terry Fox, Chantal Petitclerc, Frank Hayden, the founder of Special Olympic Movement. 
um, it, 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 we, could, we could spend a lot of time reflecting on some of the contributions that some of these great Canadians have made to disability sport. But I don't get a chance to do this very often, but I want to tell you how much I appreciate all you've done. Um, on behalf of the Paralympic movement globally. I know I don't speak on their behalf, but I, I don't know if we acknowledge your contributions nearly enough um, and the significant achievements and dedication that you've made. Yeah. As you know, David, no one ever achieves anything on their own. And it's amazing, you know, what can be achieved when no one cares who gets the credit. Or having really good grad students. Um, <laughs> Claire was outstanding. Yeah. <laughs> so Frank, I'll pass the microphone to Chad and then I'll pass it over to you so we can talk about from an athlete's perspective what's coming up with the Paris Games. But Dr. Sedra, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, David. And thank you, Bob, for sharing that history. Wow, what a history. I was writing some notes. You know, what happens on the sidelines, on the pullback, you know, what what happens on the sidelines is crucial. We all know that. But there's a prime example. I love the point about, you know, there uh, there needs to be continued work on inclusion and integration and accessibility and uh, how your family in, in the Paralympic sport has become so much bigger in the growth of people. And I think this meeting is maybe also an example of that growth, I guess, in, in different ways. So uh, I'm going to just uh, take a few minutes to set the stage, and I'm going to have a great conversation with some athletes that I'm going to introduce. I'm uh, speaking uh, here on behalf of the uh, Canadian Sport Institute Alberta Para Sports uh, Strategic Working Group, and this is a multidisciplinary and collaborative group and is developing and executing a plan to be ex an expert in supporting and servicing Paralympic athletes. This group is very productive in working towards the, vet the following key objectives. Number one, improve education and competencies for practitioners working in para sport. Number two, develop and facilitate a para sport development pathway. Number three, improve accessibility and equipment solutions, both in our own space as well as in the training environment and competition. Four, integrate para-athlete engagement and focus groups. I'm very happy that we have a, a few great athletes joining us today. And five, improve stakeholder relations and community involvement. And I think for that reason, it's great to do this session together with uh, Calgary Adapted Hub, powered by Jumpstart, which, which we have uh, representatives here from uh, the Stedward Center. Mr. Stedward here is, is here uh, himself. Dr. Leo and Kira, I forgot your last name, the Dean of U of, uh, U of A. Um, I'm, 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 I'm from the field of mental performance. And uh, just to introduce myself very briefly, mental performance, the application of really sports psychological, uh, sports psychological knowledge and strategy to optimize performance enhancement, to manage performance dysfunction, things like low confidence, low motivation, uh, competitive stress, that type of thing, and also to um, address performance impairment, which, for example, results as a, comes as a result of injury or mental health challenges, conflict, that type of thing. The simplest way to describe mental performance or mental fitness is what you say to yourself, what you're thinking, what you see in your mind, what you can see in your mind, what you're focusing on, how you're feeling, what you're feeling, how you're managing that, and what you do, like how you behave, how you perform. That is really psychology in a nutshell, and we just put that to work in sport. Currently in Canada, there is a really vibrant and healthy community of mental performance consultants that, that are engaged in most, if not all, uh, high-performance sports, including most, if not all, Paralympic sports and teams. So this conversation is obviously situated just months, weeks before the Olympic Games and then the Paralympic Games in Paris. And we want to use this moment in time to really uh, elevate the, the interest in, in Paralympic sport and to, uh, to have a conversation about what athletes go through as they're preparing for games, when they're at games, and what happens in their kind of daily training environment. So it is my pleasure to introduce uh, three athletes that are part of this panel. Uh, online, you can see on the screen is uh, Jessica Tuomela, and I had the pleasure of uh, listening to Jessica uh, a few months ago, which then led to me 
to invite her to this particular meeting. Jess is a four-time Paralympian. She, she represented Canada as a swimmer in the Sydney 2000, Athens 2004, and Beijing 2008 uh, Summer of Paralympic Games as a swimmer. During her three Paralympics, she brought home a silver medal in the 50-meter freestyle S11 class in Sydney when she was just 17 years old. After the 2008 Paralympic Games, Jess retired from swimming, having burned out from the stress that comes with training at the world-class level. In 2016, Jess came out of retirement and pursued the sport of paratriathlon. In 2019, she captured the bronze medal at the Paratriathlon World Championships. In 2021, she represented Canada at her fourth Paralympic Games when she took fifth in Tokyo. Then in 2022, she won a bronze medal at the Commonwealth Games. And she just shared with me when we spoke that she just retired last September, I believe after 17 years of doing high performance sport. Jessica has an extensive academic, uh, academic portfolio with an undergraduate degree in soci sociology from uh, Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo. She has a registered massage therapist certificate, a diploma in performance psychology from the University of Edinburgh. And Jess has been a mental health uh, and, and, and a master's in social work from the University of Southern California. Well, that's a lot too. Jess has been a mental health ther therapist at Homewood Ravensview, an inpatient mental health and addictions treatment facility on Vancouver Island. So welcome, Jess. I'll, uh, I'll ask you the first question in a few minutes. Next to me uh, at my left side is Chad, Chad Jasmine. Chad grew up with a love for sports. That passion led him to join wheelchair basketball after he broke his back in a car accident in 2004. After a year and a half of developing his skills and competing for his local club team, the Calgary Grizzlies, uh, Chad decided to try it for Team Canada. He missed the cut two years in a row, but with hard work and pre perseverance, he ultimately earned a roster spot on the national team in 2009. Um, and he just shared with me that he and his team have qualified for the Paralympics in Paris just weeks ago, six weeks ago. So it's going to be an exciting summer moving ahead. Chad takes pride in representing his, uh, no, I should say this, Chad enjoys the crashing and banging of the chairs in wheelchair basketball and draws on his experience as a former competitive hockey player when strategizing on the court. He also cites the, game inclusive the game's inclusive nature as one of its greatest attributes, and he hopes one day see both able-bodied athletes and those with disabilities competing together at the international level. A little more. Chad takes pride in representing his country and having the opportunity to learn from some of the greatest players in the game. In 2011, he signed a semi-professional basketball contract with the Trier Dolphins in Germany to further, to further develop his game. He has participated in two Paralympic Games, winning first place in 2012, and participated in three World Championships. Off the basketball court, he enjoys everything athletic and has re recently started to ski and play tennis. He studied av aviation in college and successfully earned his commercial pilot license. And he continues to fly planes and gliders recreational in his spare time. So I'm reading these long, lengthy bi biographies because it's just amazing to know how much these athletes have done, both in sport and in life. And then next to, next to me on the left side is Jake, Jake Fowley. Jake is a para ice hockey player with cerebral palsy. He has been playing para hockey for 10 years five as a forward defenseman, and five as a goalie. Also, he enjoys running, completing his first 5K and 10K runs last year. He graduated with a degree in accounting from the Southern Alberta uh, Institute of Technology in 2021, and now is studying data science and astrophysics at the University of Calgary. So welcome to you all. Please give him a hand. Very impressive uh, biographies, and it's a pleasure to start this conversation with you. Um, yeah, Jess, I put you on the spot, maybe for, uh, spot for the first question, and uh, great to see you here on uh, Zoom. Uh, I know you can't be here in person. And maybe to both J uh, J Jessica and Chad, yeah. both of you, both of you have been with your respective national teams for a number of years and quads, and have participated at multiple Paralympic Games. What would you advise other athletes about preparing for, planning for the journey and then into major games? 
Yeah, thanks, Frank. Thank you so much for inviting me. And um, I have to admit, uh, listening to the history of our the Canadian role in getting the Paralympic movement uh, got me a little emotional. I've been in the Paralympic world for a long time. And um, that was incredible to hear that story because I'm not sure that I've heard all those pieces before. So thank you for sharing that as well. Um, that I think that's a multifaceted question, Frank. I think there are so many things that go into going into a games, whether you're thinking about training, whether you're thinking about your recovery. Um, there's obviously the mental performance side of things. Um, for me, and I think maybe I have a bit of a biased opinion just because of um, what my current occupation is in, I really strongly uh, believe in the mental uh, fitness side of things. Um, that was something that took me a while to learn, to be honest. And it was something that I worked really, really hard on um, through triathlon. And I was just so privileged to work with Charlene Hoare as my, um, my mental performance uh, coach, my mental performance everything. Um, she was wonderful and I've learned so much from her and I, I really give her a lot of credit. Um, for helping me become a stronger athlete and also a stronger human. Um, I very much believe that, or I guess my advice to athletes would be, you can train as hard as you want. Everyone else is training as hard as, as they can, and you can do the same. But if you're not going to be working on what's in between your ears, um, you know, that might be where the other person has that edge on you. So I really encourage people to find out how they tick. It can be a really uncomfortable place, but as athletes, um, you know, we're used to being uncomfortable. That's the whole point. So it's another way to learn to be uncomfortable. <laughs> That's great, Jessica. Thank you for sharing that. And obviously it's a great plug for the type of work that I'm doing. So thank you for that. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, so yeah, you've been very, very working hard on your own mental fitness also with, uh, with the support of Charlene. Um, so what are some of those strategies that really helped you in preparing for those major games as, you know, as, as the weeks and, or as the months and, and weeks kind of counting down to, to, uh, um, to the start of the games? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think some of the things that I found most important were learning um, what, noise I needed to listen to and what noise I needed to filter out. And so we worked a lot on strategies of turning certain things into white noise and knowing where um, I needed support from and who I should get that from, but then also knowing who I needed to distance myself from just to remain healthy and and uh, ready to go. Um, I, I honestly think um, from my own experience, I was... Uh, you know, I had injury going into Tokyo. Um, I had other injury going into um, into the Commonwealth Games, and I I am very confident that the reason why we were as successful as we were at those games, and I say we because I have a guide and we're a team, um, and they're very much a part of that process, um, is because of that mental toughness that Shar and I worked on. It was, you know, what do you tell yourself when things are getting hard? Um, during the race, during practice, but also, again, it's that piece outside of like, there's so much being thrown at you, interviews, when can I say yes to this interview? When should I say yes to this interview? Um, social media has completely taken over. That was not a thing in 2000, by the way. <laughs> um, so there's, there's so many extra components now for athletes that weren't there before as well. Um, which are great things, but it's just knowing when to say yes and when to say no. And one of the things, um, one of the phrases that Shar and I came up with was um, when you say yes to one thing, you're saying no to another. So just be aware of what you're saying no to and is it necessary for your performance? And maybe you need to say no to the thing that you want to say yes to. So it's, it's a bit of a balance. Well, that, those are great examples, uh, Jessica. Thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, Chad, I, I assume with your experience, you you may have similar or different experiences about how you prepare for those major games and 
and and and and what helps you in the process of of when it gets closer yeah actually very similar to what she said i've been working with a mental performance coach since 2007 or something like that and i was kind of one of the stubborn ones in the beginning like oh i don't need this i know what i'm doing and stuff and over the time i've learned like i'm clearly wrong and there's <laughs> there's definite ways to approach things yeah. that you can get a better performance out of yourself um so one of the distractions i find is that uh, i the crowd, right? The crowd and the pressure that's on you. So every single game and practice that I go into, I try to play it out as if it's the Paralympics. Yeah. So when you get to the major stage, you're not overwhelmed by all the different things. Uh, it's easy to get nervous. Suddenly you have 15,000 people booing or cheering for you. And like, that can be a little nerve wracking. So I think if, if you take the approach that like every single time you train, whatever your sport is, you're training like it's the Paralympics and visualize how it would be that way, when you get to things, you're not overwhelmed. Yeah, excellent. And what she said, when she said uh, a lot of things you have to say no to, that's a huge part of it as well. The distractions of the major games, you're going to have interviews, you're going to go watch other sports and stuff like that. We're kind of blessed with wheelchair basketball that we're so, so busy. We don't have time to get ourselves in trouble or distract ourselves. So it's a little bit easier. Yeah. And nowadays with Wi-Fi in your room and stuff, it's a little easier than the first games when you, you know, you had to go out and be social and you had to kill time doing <laughs> something. Now, if you want, you can just go in and watch game video, or you can do something that's, you know, similar to what the way you'd be training at home. And so it's not quite such a shock to you, but yeah, it's, uh, you got to go through those emotions so that you don't experience them yeah. when you're in them. Right. Excellent. That's a great example about how you create habits and how you use, even simulated experiences to kind of prepare for what comes next. So thank you for, thank you for that. At the games, uh, we know that they bring a unique set of challenges, you know, and circumstances, you know, things like around accommodation, transportation, the venues themselves, security, media, and the list goes on and on and on. What were some of the challenges you had to prepare for or find ways to manage or cope with as you are in that kind of Olympic bubble? Uh, just, you know how we're athletes and we like our routine. It's hard to maintain that exact same routine. Now, suddenly you have 10,000 different things to eat in the dining hall and you're, you know, pretty particular on what you eat. So it's just trying to like stick to that routine, whether it's from a dining hall experience or what I do when I wake up. Luckily, they keep us pretty busy that we have usually a game, a practice and a video session every day. So I don't have a lot of time to fill in those extra gaps, but as much as you can, it's just trying to keep that same routine you would at home or the same routine you would at any other tournament. Yeah. That sounds like you could have worked on with a mental performance consultant to keep, to build those routines and maintain those routines. But I also know sometimes you can be thrown off of your routine. Has that happened? And how have you kind of been able to, to manage that or cope with that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you run into, let's say transport issues that, it, you're expecting it's going to take 15 minutes to get to the venue. And now you're looking at, it's going to take an hour and 15 every day and you weren't expected for it. I kind of go in prepared for the worst of like, okay, here's the things that might happen. What are some things, if I get stuck at the gym for an extra hour, what can I do at that time? Do I have refueling energy? Do I have a snack? Do I have these things? And just make sure no matter what, because yeah, you're not in control of any of this, whether it's transport, whether it's dining hall, it's all these things out of your control you have to be able to fall back to your routine and the things that keep you a sane and like keeping you focused on what you have, what your goals are. That sounds really good because I also agree that the ideal routine is ideal. That's what you want to go with, but reality dictates differently. And that means that you want to be a little bit more flexible or adaptable to what those circumstances could bring. Um, Jess, how have you, encountered challenges or unforeseen surprises when you are at some of those major games and how were you able to work through that or uh, to manage that appropriately? Yeah. So Chad stole some of my answers. Um, we, <laughs> food is a big one. Uh, when we went to the pair of Pan Am games in 2007, um, food was a challenge and with swimming, we had heats and finals. Um, and so fueling became a really big problem for us. Um, we sort of lived off of cliff bars for two weeks and now I will never eat them again, but, um, <laughs> you do what you need to do. Right. And I think it goes back to that piece of, 
um, control what you can control and think about, you know, is this within my control? And you've just got to let it go if, if it's not within your control, because that energy that you're wasting on being worked up about it is literally wasting, right? So where can you put that energy that will actually be productive and help you? Um, I think as athletes, you know, we, we strive for the optimal, right? We want the optimal and race date's got to be the optimal. Um, moving into triathlon because it's three different sports. I learned that the optimal doesn't actually exist. (laughs) Um, each venue is different. Each, uh, race course is different. Um, the water temperature might be different. The air temperature might be like, there's so many things that are so different. Um, and it's learning to adapt. I really like that word because I think it's like, okay, well, you know, the water's 29 degrees. What do we do? How do we keep ourselves cool before? How do we make sure we're getting enough fluids on the bike? So it's kind of, again, controlling what you can control. I can make sure that I'm hydrating on the bike. Um, and so it's, it's, yeah, I don't know. It, you've got to be adaptable. Like at the end of the day, you cannot be so rigid and strict in, in uh, your routine that you cannot adapt because everything will collapse because routine changes. Um, and even for us who compete outside, I didn't, I mean, this existed a little bit in swimming, but when we're outside, um, the environment just changes everything so much. So yeah, you just got to adapt. Nice. Good. Um, yeah. Before we move away from kind of the major, major games kind of focus, what else would you want to want the audience to know about your own experiences in preparing for and competing at major games? Um, can I go back to you, Jess? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think for me, there's there's two uh, key elements that I mean, of course, there's there's so much more than this, but um, to try and summarize, I think there were two things that really um, helped me be successful, and one of them was my team. Um, whether it was my teammates, my coach, my strength and conditioning coach, my like, um, just thinking about when I was listening to the history of Canadian Paralympic movement, um, I was like, man, like it was different. Cause when I went from Sydney to going to Tokyo, you know, I had so much support from this incredible IFT team. Like I, I am still so grateful to all of them, every single one of them, our nutritionist, our, you know, just wow. (laughs) Um, and also my guides, I've had different guides and we've had to learn to work together and without them, um, I wouldn't have been racing or training and they are just incredible humans that have taught me so much. Um, I said there were two things and I lost the one because I got really excited about my team. Um, (laughs) You can, you can can come back. You can circle back to that if you can remember, but you know, (laughs) this is a question that I would ask uh, very many athletes in particular, who's on your team and how can you actually leverage all the support that you have and, and build that, build that relationship and be, uh, be productive and making an enjoyable, uh, you know, work together. Chad, is there anything else that you, feel you want to let the audience know about some of your experiences about how you prepare and compete at major games something that stands out that people find interesting yeah i think two things going into major games is one i have to make sure that i do all the responsibilities i need going in so i'm going in confident and healthy as healthy as you can whether you're battling an injury make sure you're taking care of it but if you're second guessing whether did i put enough time in the weight room did i get enough shots up if you're already doubting yourself, whether you put in the work and you deserve to be there, you're going to have a tough time. So when it's training time, make sure you get, you know, all your T's crossed and your I's dotted and put in that extra work. And then the second part of it is just like, enjoy it and have fun. I remember my first games is 2012 when my first major games and we won a gold medal. And the whole thing was just a blur to me now. Like I have trouble remembering anything back where if you'd ask me, I actually probably had more fun in Rio, even though we did really, really poorly. Um, (laughs) I just, I saw that like, this isn't going to happen. This isn't going to happen forever. And I'm going to have a a set number of these that I have a chance to. So like try to take it in and, and meet some of the other athletes, see another sport if you have the chance. And finally we lost out of the tournament. So we actually had another chance to see things, but try to enjoy it. Like it all goes pretty fast. I was a rookie out there not that long ago and now I'm an old guy. So like, 
enjoy it while you can. I really, I really appreciate that message. Enjoy and have fun because it's about performance for sure. We want to compete and we want to win, but we also want to have a great experience if possible. And so I, I do think that's a really added value to to what you're what you're you're doing. Uh, Jess, do you want to circle back on uh, on the memory that you may have had uh, about what you wanted to add as well? I do remember. Thank you. And sorry about the woofing. My guide dog has opinions. Um, so I, uh, again, uh, Chad, you sparked my memory. Thank you. Um, I think it sort of aligns sort of with what you said initially is that trust that process, because when you get there, then you know that you've done everything that you possibly can. You have to carry through that um, confidence and trust yourself. Um, and then also, again, that piece of um, enjoy it. I, Sydney is a blur for me too. I don't remember. I won a medal there and that's cool and really great. Um, but like Tokyo, we were fifth and the experience is much more, um, imprinted in my brain. Um, same with the Commonwealth games. Uh, you know, it was just the experience of, of being there with the people that I was there with and, and enjoying it and like really being like, wow. And taking in the moment that was just, something I will never, ever forget. So yeah, enjoyment is very important for sure. Well, thank you both for those wonderful contributions. I'm going to move uh, move our focus a little bit uh, to kind of the almost daily, or sorry, weekly and kind of daily work that athletes are doing in their preparation and their training. I want to bring Jake in. Um, can you maybe start with describing how a weekly training regimen for you typically looks like? Um, so can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> That's good. Um, um so I, I try to train at least three times a week mm -hmm. and then cardio three times a week mm -hmm. and then just take a rest day because rest days are important to just, so, um, just so you don't overdoing it. Right. So yeah, just strength, rest and cardio. And how much are you on the ice, for example? Um, on the ice during the season, we have two practices a week. Yeah. Um, and then during the off season, just whenever you can find ice time. Sure, I get that. <laughs> and I think what Jake is uh, telling us is something that's very typical. Like it's multiple sessions over a week, multiple days, sometimes double sessions, besides the other life, right? Uh, because that is happening at the same time. Um, what were some you know, maybe some distractors, derailers that happens that happens more incidentally or maybe even recurrent that kind of throws you off your weekly plan or your your training. Um, for sure, my depression. Okay. Um, yeah. Just because it, it just because. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to be downer, but no. Uh, uh, um, but it, it does affect me daily, yeah. and um. And my, and my, my body doesn't like my legs, as you can tell, they're just moving all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, so, and, and they give me troubles pretty much every day. I fall five times a day usually. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, so, uh, so that can be a source. And sometimes I hurt myself and I fall. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so that can be a derailleur too. Right. Um, so those both physical and mental um, derailers for me. Right. Well, thank you, Jake. How about those derailers? <laughs> like uh, depression, falling, maybe hurting yourself. That throws you off. I can, I can, I, I don't have that experience, but I can, I can imagine that throws you off quite a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but I just try to keep day by day just like everybody else keep day by day yeah. and see what you can do exactly and uh, are there any other ways that you were able to kind of manage these some of these these uh these challenges and these derailers do you have some supports in ways that are really helpful uh i i go to massage once a month yeah uh, just for my, for my body yes and i i do see a, a therapist yes um for, for my for my depression right um yeah so so those are two big things. Can I ask you maybe about maybe one particular strategy that you and your therapist are working on to how to mitigate the impact of depression or how you can kind of keep moving forward? Is there something that was really useful to you? Um, just reframing your thoughts mm -hmm. is a huge one. Mm -hmm. uh, just because 
I get really down on myself. Um, so j- just reframing the thoughts right. into more positive ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that that helps a lot. Excellent. I'll I'll come back to you in a in a few seconds. Uh, Chad, you said something very powerful in preparing for the major games. You know, I I really look at my responsibilities about you know how I make training uh, work and work work well and work hard. There must be once in a while things that throw you off, derailers, things that you have to kind of manage or uh, or or mitigate. What are some of those challenges that you face on a you know week? weekly basis or daily basis that you as an athlete uh, need to kind of work around? Yeah, I think it's hard sometimes, you know, you're living with a disability, so you have all those things to deal with. And then sometimes it's uh, about finding people to train with. So I'm in a team sport and yeah. we're not always lo- local. So I'm lucky I have another national teammate around here mm-hmm. so he can help push me. Yeah, yeah. But you've got to find, there was a lot of years where I was alone here where I just had to find people who can come out and push me or you're just trying to find that drive from within yourself to be able to push yourself. It, it sucks to go out to the gym by yourself and just do chair skills. You know, everyone likes to go and shoot, shoot threes or something, but to just sit in a chair and just do the blue collar work, like nobody likes doing that. And that's the biggest challenge of like trying to motivate yourself, yeah. to do all the things that you don't like to do, yeah. especially in a game as diverse as wheelchair basketball, that we have so many skills to learn. It's pretty easy to just find yourself in the gym and do the things you like, but like, see, yeah, yeah, bearing down and doing the things that you don't like, that's that's the tougher spot. Yeah, that's right. That's great to hear. We call that deliberate practice in sports psych terms, but really focusing on what you want to get out of practice and where you can make a difference. But you bring up a really powerful um, resource support in a teammate. You know, it, yes, you need to have the foundational motivation to, to do it by yourself uh, at times, but it's so much more helpful to be doing it together as well. And you can push and support each other. Yeah, exactly. And you have a whole team of people who are relying on you as well. So you feel accountable to them. I think it would be so much harder to train as an individual athlete when the only person to hold you accountable yourself, right. where now I have 11 other guys, plus coaches, plus a whole IST staff that checks in on me multiple times a week of like, what's going on? How is training going? What are we up to? And like things like that. So if you're ever thinking of like taking time off or slacking off or doing something, you're like, well, you know, for the guys, I got to do it. So that makes it a little easier. Excellent. Um, Jess, I mean, I, maybe, maybe you've left some of these uh, challenges behind since your retirement, but as you were training hard, training every day, every week, what were some common kind of derailers challenges that you were facing as you were going through a training plan and, you know, making the best work uh, do? Yeah, I, I, hmm, that's a good question. Um, to be honest, I, I miss it. Um, so, um, so right now I think maybe I'm having a hard time thinking about those derailers because it's, um, I do really miss it. Um, I think for me, um, not believing in myself actually was probably one of my biggest derailers. Um, running was always the hardest part for me in the triathlon. It came from swimming. I move nicely in the water. It feels good. Even when I'm working hard, I get to running and like, I feel like a Goliath. Like it just, it feels awful. Um, and so I would get into these really hard run practices and I would just not believe in myself. And, um, that was, probably one of the, the, one of the biggest derailers. And so it was, um, it didn't, it wasn't that I couldn't hurt. It wasn't that I couldn't work hard. Those things I had no problems doing. Um, it's just my own confidence and how, how good of a runner I was. Um, probably up until the last year that I was in triathlon, I said that I was a wannabe runner, which is probably not the best messaging to be providing myself. So, um, yeah, it was, it's finding that belief in yourself. Um, for me during COVID, it was really challenging because, um, as a completely blind athlete, I needed, um, partners to train with, um, and we weren't allowed to train with other people. So it was a lot of indoor trainer rides and a lot of treadmill running, which I was not good at. I mean, I, I got better with a new skill I had to learn. Um, so being someone who was already not comfortable running and then it was like, okay, now you have to learn how to run. And we're like, you know, however many months out from the games and I'm like, oh no. Um, you know, so those doubts started creeping in. So I think, um, 
it's learning how to manage those and voicing them out loud to the people who can support you um, and, and help you get back on track when you need to. Cause like I've said before, it's, it's a team effort. It took a village. I was not um, as successful as I was on my own. So, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Jess. Um, maybe a last uh, conversation topic and question, uh, maybe to round it out. Uh, since we likely have an audience in this webinar with people that are active, active in different roles and programs and even levels of para-sport involvement, what else would you like to share with them? You know, for example, maybe maybe examples around your motivation or goals that, you know, keep you going. Maybe motivation or goals that other people should consider for their involvement in parasport. Uh, maybe some of the learnings that you've taken that you would like to maybe give back into the parasport community. Uh, maybe other advice you, that you have. Do you have an example for that, Jake? Absolutely. Um, for, for me, it, it's just about having fun. Uh, as uh, previously you said, um, I'm not sure by if it was by Chad or uh, Jessica, but um, to just just enjoy the sport that you compete in, and that that's what you that's what you can get to the furthest. Is if you don't have the joy, then you're not gonna want to put in the work. Um, so yeah, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, um, and just find a just find a group that that really embraces you, as I have found in um the Calgary Such Association. Um, and just um. If you can find that, even if you even if you're a like an individual um, track athlete or swimmer or whatever, um, just try to find a community that embraces you because that that means the whole that means the world. Yeah. If you have people that you surround yourself with, and yeah, that's a great example. And I I think we've heard it, already heard it from all speakers like. Uh, the team around me, you know, my teammates, the community that you're talking about. I think we all do better together. Really, we are social beings, and uh, we can use uh, we can use each other in uh, in good times as well as in hard times. So, thanks for sharing that, um, Chad. Any other advice that you want to share with the uh, audience about um, all, all of those things about motivation for parasport involvement, learnings that you've taken away, other advice? I kind of just want to steal his and add to it. it. Like just having fun goes a long, long ways. So when I was playing professionally in Germany and also playing for team Canada, um, our coach was really hard on us at the time. I got pretty burnt out of the sport and I hated wheelchair basketball for a while. Mm -hmm. And like it showed in my game and in my training. And now our coach is, he realizes that 40 years old, he's not going to get that much more out of me. If he, if I spend <laughs> 40 hours a week in the gym, right? I'm still 40 years old. So he lets me do a lot of other things. Yeah. He says, you know, go kayaking, go yeah. go downhill skiing, all that's cross training. And because of it, I have a lot healthier yeah. uh, relationship with basketball. So when I'm doing basketball, it's I'm trying to have as much fun as I can with it. I'm never like, oh God, I have a basketball tournament. I'm always like, oh, the next tournament is in two weeks, right? And just that mindset, if you can keep things fun where you want to be doing it, where training is fun to you, and that affects everybody else around you, then, you know, they're having fun and it just spreads like wildfire. I feel like that's the most important thing. I'm really glad that you all uh, bring up uh, how important it is that sport is supposed to be enjoyable and fun. And in any way you can uh, can make that work, I think that keeps us going, right? So, um, Jess, do you have anything to add to this here? Uh, any other advice that you want to share with the audience before I maybe uh, consider a couple of questions from the audience here? Um. Well, I think Jake and Chad have put it very well. Um, I would agree. I think there's there has to be um, that balance where we're humans, right? And having that holistic approach, I think, is super, super important. And um, whatever that looks like for you, and and at the end of the day, it's it will enhance your performance. Um, the one thing that I want to say, and perhaps this isn't quite answering the question, but I think it's really important, is that um, I really would like to encourage those of you who are in the audience who are involved in the development side of parasport because I think um, it's sparse um, and it's really important and if we don't have those grassroots movements um, this greater competitive side of the Paralympic movement isn't going to keep moving forward so um, I'm really excited about the development um, and also just getting people living with disabilities 
um, experiencing an active lifestyle first, you know, a lot of people like for me, the Paralympics was really exciting and that's what I wanted to do. But there are people out there who just want to be able to go for a run or swim to be fit. Um, and those opportunities are few and far between. It's sort of like either you don't do anything or you go to the games. So um, I think for me, just finding those different pathways and developing them is, is a really exciting opportunity. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It, 20 some odd years in in, uh, in Paralympic sport, there's, there's a lot to say. <laughs> No, this is great, uh, Jessica. Thank you for maybe bringing the focus back to maybe the bigger cause in sport and um, helping people develop and have active lifestyles goes a long way. And if you can enjoy some of the competitive elements and, and uh, in that, uh, whatever level you're thinking about, that is enjoyable too. Uh, so maybe uh, maybe I'll, 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 I'll get a couple of questions from the audience here in the room. I also want to give uh, both uh, Mr. Stedward and Mr. Legg a, a chance to maybe respond to the athletes or maybe ask them a question. So maybe give that a little bit of thought. But does anyone want to ask uh, any of these athletes maybe another question? Claire. Oh, we... yes, please. Please, because then the people online can hear. Hello, everybody. Claire Fuster here. Uh, thank you, everybody, for sharing all your stories. This is a little bit of a selfish question because next week I'm presenting to friends and family of Paralympians. And I was just wondering if anyone could share thoughts around how your parent or your friends or family could best support you at the games, either from afar or while if they attend. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Who wants to take this question first? Jessica? Uh, J Chad points with Jess. Okay. Um, so my recommendation would be to ask friends and families to ask the athlete how they can best support them. Um, because my version of support is very different from somebody else's. Um, I tend to go into a little bubble and I shut the world off and I'm like, no, thank you. Um, but other people really want that connection. So I think the best way to go about it is asking. Um, it's really fun to get to the village and have had someone sneak little things into your suitcase that are like meaningful. Um, and again, like make sure you really know the person so that you're not kind of upsetting them, you know, but um, yeah, those would kind of be my two pieces of advice. Thanks, Jess. Do you have something to add to that friends and family question? Honestly, it's a tough one for me because when I get to the games, I don't really care. Okay. Like, I'm, I'm glad that my, my friends and my family support me in what I do. And like, they're always checking in on how wheelchair basketball is going. But once I'm gearing up, even from now until the games, like, I don't really care if my parents are coming or if they're getting tickets and stuff like that's all on them. And I, I'm just like, I'm focused for what I have to do. So like she said, I guess it's different for everybody. That's a good. You got your answer, Claire. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Stedward or Mr. Leg, do you have uh, maybe a response to the panel of athletes here? Do you have a question for them? I have a question. Um, so the people that are here today and the seminar that's being hosted, and thank you, Letitia, by the way, for Letitia Jansen, who organized these. She's the Research Knowledge Translation Coordinator. Thank you. For the Calgary Adapted Hub powered by Jumpstart and also a sledge hockey coach and the assistant coach on the provincial team for para ice hockey. And so the question that I would have is, and Jessica, you raised it. So you asked the people in the room or those who were involved in grassroots to continue doing it and to perhaps enhance or, or expand but within this room, we have pieces of the entire development system. So we have people that are involved in the grassroots, whether it's Calgary Adapted Hub, Sledge Hockey, uh, Calgary, uh, the Stedward Center. But then we also have people from the Alberta, the, sorry, the Canadian Sport Institute, Alberta, that are part of the process of taking athletes from the grassroots system to the high performance system, which are then going to be competing in the Paris Paralympic Games. So what advice would you have for us in the room to, for us to create a better system? that allows us to uh, both create a strong grassroots system, 
but also create a pathway for those that want to compete at the, the high performance level. You want to take that first, Jake? You said okay? Sure. Um, for, for, for me, it's just, it's just getting the word out there. E even though I know like everybody's tried, every kid continues, continues to try to get the word out there about Paralympic sports. It, 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 like for me, at least, it's it's about like person to person interaction because th th that's the most Im impactful way. Is if you see someone like with a disability, um, and, and like I try to ask um, people at the university that are in wheelchairs or like that have, I know I'm I might be a little weird by doing that. <laughs> um, <laughs> But just going out to Sony, but um, I think I have the card for that. <laughs> um, um, but um, just <clears throat> just getting the word out there is, uh, as they keep saying. Sorry. Yeah, great. Yeah, I think the the whole situation's pretty good now. Like it's a lot better than it was when I started in my career. I think I'd like to see a little bit more focus on like the grassroots part of things of like, I think too many times we put people in and they get five games into wheelchair basketball and people are like, Oh, you're going to play for the national team. We put them through all this like rigorous stuff. And a lot of times they just still haven't found their passion for it yet. Or maybe that's not the sport for them or there's other sports. So a lot of times I think we are kind of putting the cart before the horse where like we should really stretch to just have fun and get as good as you can at the local level. And if you move up and you move up, that's great. But I think too many times we're always like, I'll see a new kid and I'm bad for it too. I see a new kid. And I'm like, oh, he's got national team potential. And then of course I'm like a little harder on that kid. Right. But I think if we enable that to just organically grow and we just find somebody and they're having fun and let that bloom into what it becomes, I think that's more important. Well, thank you, Chad and Jake. Uh, you've got a couple of really good answers there. In person contact, get the word out there and really develop that joy in the sport first before we think about how to how to transfer that's that's what i was hearing um it's almost time to stop uh maybe in the next minute or two does anyone have a kind of a pressing question to finish here oh yes jen leo <laughs> So my question is connected to our systems questions. I'm just curious how we can support you on the other end. So as you're an athlete thinking about kind of approaching retirement, leaving high performance sport, how can we then support you to transition so that you stay active for life? Maybe it's around employment, coaching, whatever that looks like. That would be really helpful too, because I appreciate this kind of, the system's a whole bunch of different pathways. Thank you. You want to take that chance? Uh, yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of that person you just referred to of like getting ready to retire kind of thing. And yeah, I think, uh, coaching opportunities is a good way to keep, you know, keep what I've learned and give back to the program, things like that. If you're able to keep athletes around, what better way to learn from than somebody who's been through it all before. Right. So coaching for me, I always have the passion. I'll probably die on court yelling at some kid someday. So I'll, I'll always play forever but I guess that varies sport to sport. So um, in our sport, a lot of us play for a long time. So I plan to, um, yeah. Do you have something else, Jake? Thank you. Um, for me, um, I know it's important to give back. Um, so for me, like when I plan to retire, I would like to still be involved in the sport. Um, so if you could like, help um help like someone like me like get, get involved in coaching or or like as a mentor kind of person <laughs> um i think that'd be important too excellent yes of course ashley we're here we're here together so so maybe I'll just, I'll take us all the way back to when Annie and Nicole and the CSI Paris track group, we all came together because one of the things we didn't want to lose in our community, and then with the uh, Sedward Center as well across the province, 
is we wanted to break down also myths or misconceptions about the Paralympic Games prior to them. Uh, we noticed that here we had the pleasure of hosting the Special Olympics Canada Winter Games here in the city, uh, thanks to Karen Domit's leadership earlier in February. And that was one of our missions on the grassroots side of things was to celebrate what the Special Olympics were. So maybe I'll, I'll frame it in the positive uh, to ask you one last question. What can we celebrate and share in the community in these next few weeks leading up to the Games that could really highlight the value of both the movement, as Dr. Sedward has shared, and the athlete experience in the Paralympics? May I? Yes, Jess, please. <laughs> okay, so pardon me, but I think the best way to highlight and to celebrate is that Paris sport is basically badass. Like <laughs> Chad talked about his, where he enjoys the crashing and the banging, right? There's no crashing and banging in standing wheelchair, uh, standing basketball. If you look at paratriathlon, right, you've got women on tandem bikes going over over cobblestones and train tracks at 70 kilometers an hour like so i think the thing is we just need people to actually witness what is happening in order for people to get excited about it because it's it is just wild the things that people are doing that's my two cents <laughs> i figured that Jad, chad has something to say about kind of the badass uh kind of picture in parasport yeah, for us, I think it's all about getting people out to one game because people have misconceptions about wheelchair basketball and they assume it's going to be slower. And then they see Nick come through and take me out and I'm laying on the floor and he's talking crap to me as he wheels away. And they're like, well, this is kind of not what I expected, right? So I think once we get people out to one game, then they're like, oh, wow, like I would watch this if I could come again. Jake, another way of celebrating um, Paris sport and um, its accomplishments and your experience? Uh, again, just like like Chad and Jessica has have said, like just getting people out to the events, and just because, yeah, it is pretty badass. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Jake. Well, this is great ending of uh, of a fantastic meeting. Uh, well, thank you for attending. Uh, I want to maybe only do one round of applause, but I want to. I want to thank all the panelists like Chad, Jake, Jessica. I'd like to thank Mr. Stedward, Mr. Lake for being part of this. I want to uh, thank Ashley and our team for collaborating on this, uh, the support that we have from Dr. Leo there, and all of your, Leticia, for setting this up, and, uh, and Annie, who's, uh, who's running the show. So, uh, so thank you all for, for attending. I hope it was worth your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jessica. I wish you a good rest of your day and hopefully we'll be in touch soon again. Thanks, Frank. Thanks so much for inviting me. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.